Thanks for coming. What I'm going to do today is talk to you about how I think corals may be able to survive climate change. <laughs> corals are unique. They exist at the interface of water and land, which is a very stressful environment, both chemically and physically. And yet reefs are geological structures built by living organisms. And the organisms that build reefs are corals. Corals are colonial animals related to jellyfish. And if you look at a coral colony, it is made up of individual polyps that are connected by a little bit of tissue. And that bit of tissue is only a few millimeters. Underneath it is the calcium carbonate skeleton that makes up a coral reef. And so corals are the trees of the ocean. They build the three-dimensional structure they provide habitat for a myriad of fishes, for shrimp, for lobsters, for other animals that we rely on as food sources. So they're economically important as food sources, but also because they provide protection for our shorelines against a wave action, for example. And when we lose these corals, what happens is that our beaches erode in some places in the Caribbean as much as a meter a day. So these reefs and corals are um, ecologically and economically important for us. Corals are very closely adapted to their environment. They uh, meet a certain kind of carbon chemistry of the water that allows them to build those hardy um, skeletons. They also need light because they live in partnership with single-celled algae that are inside their tissues and that photosynthesize, use light to make food. They also live within fairly narrow temperature ranges. They like the warm tropical waters that um, have these highlight conditions. So here is a um, close-up of those algae living in the coral tissue. It's that little, little square up there. And these are these golden yellow brown algae inside the tissue that give the coral its color. When temperature rises, just two or three degrees Celsius above normal, that partnership between the coral animal and the algae breaks apart and the algae leave the coral. And what's left behind is the translucent animal tissue and you can see the white skeleton of the coral beneath. So in mass coral bleaching events, when temperature rise just a little bit, these colorful living structures turn into ghostly white reefs. And these mass coral bleaching events have happened this past year in, along the Great Barrier Reef and the year before that. And in the Caribbean, we also had two of those events in a row. Once, when these conditions last too long, then the coral dies and turns into rubble. Now, the good news is that reef building corals are, are true phoenixes. They, they can rise from the ashes and rebuild reefs by having new coral babies settle and bits of tissue that are left behind grow into new colonies. And corals really have amazing abilities to, to regrow as long as the disturbances are new, not too quick after one another. So when, when the frequency of these warming events becomes too high, when, when there's not, a long, not, not a lot enough uh, of a break in between these disturbances, then reefs cannot rebuild. And as you can see here, the um, average temperature rises year after year has just been so high that um, the ability of reefs to come back has been compromised. So how do corals um, may survive this climate change? There's principally three roads we can take. We can work on increasing the size of existing coral colonies and coral nurseries. We can try to work on increasing the genetic diversity through assisted sexual reproduction. And we can foster the natural tendency of corals to hybridize to allow for more rat rapid ad adaptation to increasing temperatures. So in coral nurseries, what folks do is they take a little branch of existing wild colonies and then bring them near shore, hang them on these trees where they are off the ground, away from their natural predators, exposed to high currents and light conditions, and that results in very high growth rates. So over a short period of time, you make a lot of coral, 
that you then can back, put back out onto the reef. And that's beneficial because, as I said before, these corals provide habitat for other organisms and help protect our shorelines. However, you just made more of the same. So this, these colonies are just as susceptible to the higher temperatures as what you've had before. The second approach is to try to work on increasing the genetic diversity of these populations because by chance there might be a couple in there that are pre-adapted to those higher temperatures and may be able to survive them better. And this is work I've done over the past few years with a group called Seacore International where we go out after the August full moon when these corals release eggs and sperm into the water column. We put these handmade nets over them, we collect the eggs and sperm, we cross them and make coral babies and those we can also put back out on the reef here. And uh, we've done so quite successfully. The reason this works is because the, we raise the coral babies in these really protected environments and so we get higher survival rates from that what we would see in, in nature. This does increase genetic diversity, but it still relies on that chance event that one of these corals might be pre-adapted to the higher temperatures. So lately, uh, my group, in collaboration with researchers at Nova Southeastern Universities, have concentrated on these two severely threatened Caribbean corals, the staghorn and the elkhorn coral. And these two coral species are now at 10% of their former population sizes. But they form a hybrid. So uh, eggs and sperm from the staghorn can fertilize eggs or sperm from the elkhorn coral and make a hybrid species. This is similar to when uh, you cross a horse and a donkey and the mule results. And just like in the case of the mule, these corals, the hybrids, are supposedly sterile. So you cannot make more of those, just like um, mules will not reproduce with each other. This was at least the um, status of the field until we started looking using whole genome sequencing and we found evidence that um, perhaps just recently these hybrids actually can reproduce with each other. So you can get a second generation or perhaps even further generations. And hence, um, these might really be a way of generating a lot of new genetic diversity in a very short period of time because these hybrids are actually better than either parent species in, in surviving high water temperatures and high light conditions and they're more resistant to, um, against diseases. They also have really high um, morphological diversity, and so we think that perhaps this hybrid might be able to play the role that the parent species did, um, but that are now um, so severely depressed. So when we think about the future of reefs, uh, I think what we're looking at is that individual coral species will survive, but reef ecosystems as we know them may not. And this will have ecological and economic consequences for us. So while we work on slowing down climate change, there's a, a few active conservation measures we can take to help bridge the time until uh, temperature rise, rises slow down so that these corals can survive as the reef ecosystems we know. Thank you.